Hello YouTube, welcome to the video where we are going to be answering some questions about selling used books FBA. I had a subscriber send me a great lengthy comment with lots of questions in it and I thought what better way to answer than do an actual video rather than typing it out in a YouTube comment response. So without further ado, let's get stuck into it. Uh, we've got nine questions here and the first one is how do I tackle shiny object syndrome um, the subscriber said that he'd um, he was been dabbling in books in regular way and wasn't really sure um, whether to dive into one of them or try doing both my advice with this is always try to get really good at one thing uh, before you branch out into other business models that is probably the main reason why I've stuck with books because I figured that if I go really deep and focus really hard on one particular niche and get much better than everyone else at it hopefully um, become an expert in your field or your niche then you're more likely to um, succeed and leverage that expert knowledge to a higher capability it's better to be a master of one thing than the jack of all trades we don't really want to be jack do we so i hope that clears up shiny object syndrome um, i really think you should try and dig into whatever um, is the most important thing for you focus on that and try not to um, diversify and diffuse your energy too much um, the second question is kind of related to what I was just talking about. Why have I stuck with books? Um, one of the reasons is just that I started um, doing pretty well with it within six months of selling on the US market. I um, sold $30,000 worth of books in month seven, I believe. And I just thought, well, this is my ticket out of the nine to five. And we just scaled from there and saw pretty phenomenal results in year two nearly hitting 500k and then we've scaled to um, one million dollars um, plus since they're selling three million dollars plus over the last five years on amazon so um, that's probably the main reason is just that it's worked i enjoy it i thought that this if this is something that i focus on um, it's going to work well for me and it's paid back dividends um, now i'm at a point where it, the business is pretty systematized and i am looking at doing other things but that's because i am I'm, I'm able to do that because i didn't get shiny object syndrome at the start um, i got really good at it and i and because it doesn't take up too much time of the day i'm able to focus on other things which i'll talk about later in the video do I plan, plan to branch out to regular OA or wholesale? I've looked at these options a bunch of times in the past and um, it never really um, struck me as something that I want to pursue just because I didn't feel like I'd squeezed the juice of the book lemon quite as quite enough. Um, there's still plenty of gains to be made in the book market, I'm sure. Um, there's so many books out there um, and prices are always dropping, so there's no reason why... Um, I can't scale to more than uh, the sales that I did last year. Um, we're in a bit of a rebuilding phase at the moment, so I don't really want to try doing um, OA or wholesale. Also, wholesale um, from a UK standpoint might be a bit more difficult just because I know it's easier if you've got your own warehouse. I know there's plenty of ways around that, and that's I'm just making excuses, but I do think that um, it's easier to do if you're a US resident or you have access to a warehouse because that brings your cost of goods down and um, also just being able to get on the phone to um, US wholesalers is obviously easier if you're in the US. I'm five or six hours ahead or even nine hours ahead of California, so if I wanted to call wholesalers up, I'd have to do it in the evening. I don't really like working in the evening, so call me lazy, but wholesale hasn't appealed. Regular OA, we did dabble a little bit in buying some trainers and shoes uh, Q4 last year because we didn't have um, any stock capacity to send regular stock of books in, so we, we were buying and selling a few shoes and we, we made some nice profits from that, but it didn't really grab my attention i didn't really get uh, that excited by it so i thought um we'd rather double down on books again so um i did feel like the shoes and trainers was a little bit of a shiny object syndrome so i decided to not pursue that you never know we might go back into it but i've got my eyes on other things currently which again i'll, I'll probably mention towards the end of the video question number four am i worried about the future of books uh, we do get a lot of questions of this nature. Uh, people are always concerned about ebooks and 
PDFs and Kindle books and, and everything of that nature. But even though Kindle sales are increasing and ebook sales are increasing, it does not mean that physical book sales are decreasing. I have not noticed any decrease in sales, even though um, there's obviously a lot of ebooks in the market. I think, particularly with textbooks, students like to read and copy from a physical book. And also, if you're selling hobbyist books or obviously coffee table books, for example, which, which make a really good profits, you can get some great coffee table books um, flips on Amazon and obviously it's not as good in a Kindle um, having that because it's, those books are obviously for show um, but so yeah ebooks I would say um, don't really factor into the physical book market some people just love having a book um, obviously having the flex of a really big library in your house means that physical books are always going to be um, a have strong market demand and um, students still want those physical textbooks so I'm not worried about the future of books I think uh, the future of books is rosy I'm bullish on books I always have been and always will be and that is that um, number five what prep center am I using so I was using Central Virginia prep for the whole of my Amazon career until Q4 last year because of what happened with restock limits I wasn't able to send any books in um, FBA so we decided to do a bit of FBMing which I'll talk about later in the video and um, Central Virginia Prep don't facilitate FBM orders so I moved over to Little Owl because they were capable of doing that. Little Owl also are willing to fulfill orders on other websites as well such as if you wanted to sell an ebooks and eBay which we dabbled in a little bit. Um, so that was the reason for the switch there was no other reason um, in particular because I, I think um, Central Virginia Prep is an absolutely fantastic company and Shanna's doing a great job there I will still recommend it to all booksellers who just want to do FBA because they do a great job and we've never had any problems with them over the last four or five years so um, as long as you've got a good relationship with your prep centre that's all that matters and you, if you know that they're checking your books and they're grading them correctly um, and sending them in at an affordable price that's all you want Question number six, what sourcing methods do my team use? I think on the comment you uh, mentioned Keeper and Flipmine. Um, our team just use a bunch of sourcing methods. So Keeper is the main one. We do probably 75% Amazon to Amazon flips. We buy lots of books on eBay. So we scan in eBay. And we, we might be using sniping software on eBay for auctions. We're also scanning our previous orders over the last week, two weeks or a month or, or going further back. And we'll, we'll, we'll run those um, ASINs through BookFinder um, or just check them on Amazon to see if there's a buying opportunity. Um, obviously, we're setting loads of alerts with Keeper. We've got two accounts on there. Um, and we've got a few other sourcing techniques that we use, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this video. I probably will do a video on a few of the other ways that we find books. But um, long story short, my team uses lots of different sourcing methods. There's not one in particular um, that we only use, but Keeper is obviously great. Using Product Finder, using Product Viewer, using Keeper Deals, are they, they are an absolute goldmine. Question number seven, what repricer am I using and why? So the repricer I'm currently using is Channel Max. I've only been using it for about two weeks. We're just playing around with it at the moment. There's a month free trial, so we thought we'd give it a try. Uh, the only reason I was using Be Cool before, didn't have a problem with Be Cool at all, but I like the fact that Channel Max is very fast. It's very powerful and you can set really good custom rules on it. For example, you can raise your price at random hours of the day, which can lead to a customer putting an item in the cart at say $70 and then you might raise it up to 100 and then the next day you might bring it back down to 70 and then they'll see that the book's gone from 100 to 70 and they might think they're getting more of a bargain and the customer psychology um, comes to comes to the fore there and, and you might be able to make more sales through that. Scott Needham who is um, Amazon smartest seller he's got a podcast and he's got like an eight figure Amazon wholesale business he he uses um, th these strategies to increase your sales so if he's doing it I'm gonna be doing it too because why the hell not so still in the learning process of it but we really like it so far um, nothing wrong with be cool at all really I do like be cool 
I think it's great. I just wanted to change and I wanted to see if this new technique would lead to increased sales, but I will report back on that in the future because we don't really don't really have enough information and analysis to give you um, a full um, opinion on channel max. Question number eight, how do I price textbooks in and out of season? Um, we don't really change our pricing rules that much. Obviously, textbooks aren't gonna get as high a price um, out of season, especially in say June, July, November, December. So we will just make sure our minimums and maximums are gonna get us a decent profit. We'll let Channel Max or Be Cool do the rest of the work. As long as we are fighting for the buy box, the used buy box, then we usually will get sales and we're trying not to buy too many textbooks that only sell in August or January unless we're buying them say a month before. So we want to buy textbooks that sell year round um, and it's all about the profit margin really as long as we're making a minimum of 15% profit margin on, on a textbook then we're happy with that. I wouldn't focus too much on would worry too much about your pricing in and outside of textbook season just because you could end up spending more time worrying about that and less time sourcing and finding good books which is probably the most important part of the game but in textbook season if you haven't got that if you haven't got oops loom cut out there and i don't know why and my editing skills are not proficient enough to sew this together neatly so Here's a little interlude. Where was I talking about textbooks in and out of season? I think I was talking about if you have got not that many ASINs, if you've got under a thousand ASINs and you are uh, you know which textbooks you are selling and it's August time, I do would recommend pricing all of your books up a significant amount. Obviously, you want to do your keeper analysis and that. See where the used price went last year and then you can anticipate roughly where it will go again this year presuming that there isn't a new edition out maybe tanking the price but usually if you've picked well you're going to be choosing textbooks which have been around for years and that lots of schools and universities want to um, have it on their curriculum and therefore used prices are going to skyrocket so if you want to make sure your profit margins are extra juicy i would recommend pricing your books way up and don't get scared by um, certain FBA sellers may be tanking the price a little bit like big sellers like rent you and apex media they're not too worried about increasing the profits during that season because they've probably got so many books to sell so they actually will just try and get through as many books as possible whereas if you are cherry picking like most of us watching will be then I would recommend pricing your books up and really holding you're holding the line as it were and if you can wait until you're one of the few fewer like last FBA sellers then you can usually charge way more and the student will not realize that they're buying a book at a really inflated price because they've probably um, gone on the Amazon listing last minute and they're buying the book for 150 bucks when they could have got it for 70 a month before or even a few days before so you want to be that seller who's making those extra bucks quite easily just by waiting until a little bit further into July uh, August sorry and um, you know, getting those big healthy profit margins and the final question here what have we got have I been doing FBM I kind of touched on that but it's probably worth just diving in a little bit more just to mention because I'm sure a lot of you might have wanted to try and do FBM just because the fees are much lower than FBA and uh, you can obviously sell books for a lower price because there's no FBA um, massive fee you can't really sell books FBA for less than 15 bucks because you're probably going to make a loss so it opens up a lot more books for you admittedly lower profit but if you can buy a book for three dollars instead of 15 fbm um, plus shipping then you still might make ten dollars on a very so, so the ROI, roi is really good so that's why we wanted to do fbm and also we didn't have space in fba so we, it was kind of a matter of necessity i just thought um, we are finding lots of good deals um, where there's only a couple of offers on the listing and one of them is quite high one is quite low so if we pick up that fbm offer then we can flip it on amazon um, and send it back in let's say if we bought it at 10 we can flip it at 40 and then there'll still be a higher offer 
we thought we could have capitalized on that and we have made decent profit on the fbm books i think uh, average of 15 dollars net profit on each book but the problem is just the turn rates have, uh, is slower than fba and we can't charge that extra say 20 30 percent prime bump and also you don't necessarily get the buyer box as much um, and obviously you've got to deal with customer returns and stuff so we are still doing a few fbm but i'm trying to limit it as much as possible because we've obviously we've got more uh, warehouse space now so we just want to chuck everything at fba and the way i see it is if my team's bought at fbm and they thought they could resell fbm there's no reason it can't be an fba unless it's particularly high rank but i try to tell my team not to buy books too high rank anymore we were doing lots of that last year but it kind of bit us in the ass um last month because we had a lot of stock that we had to dispose of and with fba fees increasing quite considerably uh, over the last few months we can't really afford to have too many removals or disposals so that is the video that's me answering nine questions hopefully that gives you a little bit of an update of what i've been up to um i've got plenty more videos incoming but i thought this would be a good one to dust off the cobwebs and get me into the flow of putting out content for you guys i'm going to be sharing lots more valuable content on all things book selling fba if you enjoyed this and made it to the end i really appreciate you could you please like the video please comment on it if you've got any suggestions for content i would love to hear it because i as i say this was um this video is brought about by a comment from a lovely chap i'm sure who met fast track fba and here is the video so if other people want to do the same i'm work, i'm definitely up for suggestions and um, that's me that's the video ciao for now catch you in the next one bye bye